um, talk about the principles of service design. And actually, there are five principles. And I'll talk through each of the principles. Um, so the first principle of survey design is user-centered. And I think you're, it's not a new term to you, user-centered. But sometimes people just know the term, but they don't know the real meaning of user-centered. Mm -hmm. right. So can anyone say about their um, interpretation of what is user-centered? Okay, so actually the user center design approach is um, to involve users from the beginning of a uh, design research or, or a design project to the end. So it really depends on the, the scale of uh, a project. Sometimes people involve users at the beginning, sometimes people involve users at the middle of the project, some people involve users at the end, but the the real ideal user-centered design approach is to involve users from the beginning to end. Right. So what I mean from beginning to end is that from the beginning of the projects and you involve users in the team. And to the end means that you also involve users in the evaluation of your interface or your products. So user-centered design means that you involve users from the beginning to end. Not the ideal uh, approach is to involve users all the time, right? So, so actually you can see the, the graph up here. So actually user-centered design is one of the major principles of service design. So like I just mentioned, service provider, they have their own values and their objectives. So they want to, service provider, they want to make money. But at the same time, they have to satisfy users' needs. So you can see there is some color balance between the two major components. So it really depends on the, the project's time, time frame, or it really depends on the, the, the resources of a service provider. So they, uh, they will put, it really depends on the scale and the resources. They will, they will put more weight on the user's part. But ideal, ideally, the service provider, whenever they try to develop a service, they have to put a lot of weight on the service, uh, on the user's needs. Right. So you can see at the bottom, so the services are created through the interactions between the service provider and the customers. So it really depends on the real world situations. Now we are, we are saying the ideal situation is to put all resources and we listen to the customers. Right, but a lot of times we have a lot of constraints. Right. So user center is that users need and their wants and also users they have their own physical capabilities and they have their own limitations. So whenever we try to do a service design, we have to consider about not only the needs or the wants. Sometimes users, they have some limitations, capabilities. Like for example, some users, they cannot hear. Sometimes some users, they are old. So it really depends on the situation, say your users, the, the clients, their characteristics. And whenever you design an interface of products or a service, you have to take the, the, all of them into account. So that's uh, user centered. And so, so normally when we uh, perform a service design projects, and the five items are the important uh, key information we want to get from doing a service design. The first is we have to identify who are the users. The second, we have to understand the users. Do they have a particular goal in a service? or what are the tasks they need to perform in order to uh, get involved in the service and what are the user's experience levels of the service 
sometimes users they if a if they already have some experience about a similar service, then it will be easier for us to design a service for them. But a lot of times when we design a service, and since it's a brand new, and we don't take into account user's experience, so when, so when people they deliver a service to a customer or a client, and if we don't in take into account user's center approach, then you will see a lot of times, you will see users, they spend a lot of time to learn what is the service. Right, so that becomes a, a, a big problem. Of course, when like, uh, for, for example, if you want to design a service on a train, right, so users, they don't, they don't, they normally don't have ideas about the services provided in a train. So whenever they get on the train, and when they just sit on the seat, so they don't know what things are provided in the train, right? So users, a lot of time, they have to figure out what are the services provided. And once they get an idea of the services, maybe it's the time when they get off the train. So sometimes they don't have, it would take them a lot of time to get familiar with the whole service. So when we design a service, we still have to take into account the experience level of the users. So maybe if we are designing a service on the train, then of course it's the service on a train is different from the service on an airplane. So the things you provide to the users, how can we design in a way that can be easily picked up by the users? So that's the things we have to consider also. And the third, uh, the fourth one is of course, we have to consider about users' needs from the service. And also, what do users think the service should be? Right, so uh, later on we'll talk about right. So later on we'll talk about the Norman's model. I think maybe Professor D already talked about that. Well, I wish you memory student to my HCN course, so we can just assume that they have one. <laughs> okay. All right, so user center. So actually, there are three major principles of user center design. Um, so we are talking about principles of survey design, but when we are doing user center design, there are also three principles. So the first principle is to involve users as, as, as early as possible. Because sometimes when you already you make a decision to develop products, and sometimes it's difficult for uh, designers to get back to make a change. So that would be good to involve users as early as possible in the design phase, so that you can get an understanding about, get some ideas about the design guidelines at the very beginning, so that you will not um, design in the wrong way. And the second of the user center design principle is empirical measurements of service. What I mean by empirical measurement is that uh, when we uh, try to evaluate a service, then um, the principle of user center design is to evaluate it in the field, not in the lab. Because in the lab, uh, a lot of settings, they are um, human men, they are not really uh, reflect the real situations and the things happen in the real world. So when we try, what, whenever we, we try to evaluate or test a service or even a, a product or, or a prototype, um, the principles tells us we evaluate in the field. And the third one is iterative design. So uh, we have to go through a design process again and again. We find problems and we fix it fix the problem and then we test the problem, evaluate, evaluate the design and then we will still go back the, the whole loop again and again. Right. And other important principles of uh, user-centered design is um, of course services are designed to support users' behavior. Right. So we, we don't want uh, users change the behavior to adapt to our service. We want to design our service to fit users' behavior. 
And the second principle is services design for users' characteristics. So like I just said, if we are designing services for the kid or for the adults or for people they cannot see or people with the uh, some uh, physical limitations, we have to consider about that. And also design decisions are uh, taken with within the context of users and their work and the environment. And why why this will be another principle is that we are designing a service. A service takes place in the environment. It does not take place on a particular product or tool. So we are designing not only a product, we are designing the whole environment. And the environment also is consists of human products, tools, and also the interactions between the environment and the tools and the human. So it really depends on different environments. They will encourage different human products interaction. So we're, when we do survey design, we have to consider about environment as well, whether it's cold or it's hot, and so everything you have to consider about that. So those are the principles of user-centered design. And all right, but those are just the first principles. All right. So I'll just give you some examples. This will be a traditional designer center survey design approach. So whenever you want to have go to a barber shop or something you want to wash your head, you can see this person like pushing <laughs> the kid's head under the water faucet, right? That's a traditional design designer center design approach. Right. But this will be a user centered design approach. <laughs> right. So you see the, the kids uh, laying down on the chair with a small face, right? That will be a uh, user centered design, a uh, survey design. Okay. And another example, okay, still washing the head, right? So this is, is it a user centered design? Uh, you can see this guy and it's just. <laughs> Doing this to another guy? Alright. This will be a user centered design, service design. Then you see this guy is kind of washing the head, uh, having a haircut or something. Then you can see this monitor showing him the, the, the prices of the stocks. So maybe this guy is kind of uh, doing some investments. So you can see he really enjoyed the whole experience right when you have a fail right so again you have to be user centered think about users needs right okay so the first principle user centered and the second principle is called creative like i said previously uh, a service provider they have their own different departments so they have their own capabilities, they have their own technologies, they have their own uh, training employees. So whenever um, a, we try to develop a service design idea, we have to involve all the stakeholders in the design process. Because different person, different people, they have their, their own different uh, mindsets, they have their own different uh, limitations of the, the departments they have on the limitations. So whenever we have to design a service, it's better we involve all people, all stakeholders. So the stakeholders can involve uh, managers, monitors, engineering, engineers and designers. And also we have to involve the, the people who really interface with the service and the, the customers. Clients. So involve all stakeholders in the design process. This will be a second principle. Uh, the third principle is uh, sequencing. So actually, every service they have uh, a service time period or service time frame, time frame. And so the service timeline normally it includes the pre-service period and actual service period and also post service period 
So we are designing not only the actual service period, we are designing the pre-service period and also we are designing the post-service period. So, all right, so imagine post the service um, timeline, the service period, they're important. It's very critical in survey design. And I can give you one example for post-service period. Like, um, think about uh, the pre, all right, so if you want to buy something uh, in nowadays, so the pre-service period means that you have to do some investigations, research on the internet, and try to find the price, right? Or finding some comparisons between different parts, right? So if the service provider can provide this kind of information, that will be called a pre-service period. An actual service period means the actual going into a store or a restaurant to uh, enjoy the service or to receive the service. And the post-service period means that whenever a person or a client, they finish the service when they go home. And a lot of times we'll see a lot of service providers, they will send messages, emails, or a lot of information to people. So that, those will be considered a post-service period. So when we are designing a service, we are designing the whole service timeline, not only the actual service period. Right. So that's the another principle of service design. So we have to think about sequencing uh, service uh, timeline and co-design and user center. So actually, a service timeline is can be decomposed into uh, touch points and their interactions between uh, the service moments. <coughs> and I will talk about the touch points later on. So the touch point means the, the the contact point between service provider and the client. So we'll talk about this later on. Just keep this in mind. So, uh, touch point we have to design the touch points in the survey design. And also evidencing. So evidence means evidence of a service. So whenever you design a service and you have to provide some artifacts representing the service. So imagining that like, if you go to a holiday, like during your past holiday, did you get any souvenir from the store, right? So those can be considered, like if you go to a, a, a museum or a theme park, you really enjoy the service, but you want to, the service provider wants to extend the pleasant experiences of clients. So the way that they, they can extend the service is through the evidence, the uh, service evidence. So the service evidence, actually it is a tangible artifact. It's not intangible. So it's a tangible artifact related to a service process. So again, it can be a souvenir that really reminds people about their present uh, experiences of a service. Or it can be an email, can be a bill, or it can be a sign, or it can be any kind of products to sustain the user's feelings or it's their good experiences of the service. So the fourth principle is evidence. And the fifth is the holistic. Of course, the service it, um, involves everything. So we should also see, look at the survey design uh, from uh, a big systems perspective, we don't look at each individual element. So uh, the fifth uh, principle is holistic. So we look at the whole uh, server design from a perspective of human tools, environment, technology. So the whole environment should be considered. Okay. So now we finish the principles. So. I hope that in the future or when you are doing your survey design projects, keep in mind of those 
five big principles. And next, so now you get ideas of the principles. Now we are moving to the survey design phases. Right. And I hope you will not you will not feel disappointed <coughs> about the process because the process is very similar to uh, traditional uh, product design process. Right. So so here I, I got the survey design phases from uh, a researcher in 2005. He published a, 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 a electronic book. He talks about, he kind of compares about different service design process and survey design framework. And I found out that most of the methods, they are very similar to a user-centered design process. Right. So here, user-centered design process. So user-centered design process, I think most of you are already familiar with it. The first, identify the needs. And then, identify, after identify needs, you analyze the needs, and you perform the design. After you do the design, you generate prototype. Then you evaluate the prototype. And then do the analysis again. And then, you can see the second, and the third, and fourth. They are iterative. Right, and at the end, if you think you're comfortable to deliver the products, then you implement your design and products and deploy it to the market. So these are uh, user-centered design process um, and phases. And let's go back to here. All right. So the survey design phases, the first understanding. So understanding means we researching um, users uh, conscious needs and unconscious needs. And con unconscious needs means some latent uh, they unconscious needs. So we research um, users conscious unconscious needs at the beginning. So using uh, interview, observation, contextual inquiry, or uh, shadowing of a number of techniques. An example is that so uh, sometimes if we want to identify how users pay their bills, maybe we'll interview a person, find out how they go through the, the paying bill process. And if we want to find out a person how he find a parking space in an airport, then we might want to do observations, observing how a person is finding their way in a parking lot. So those the purpose of those activities, they, they are all trying to understand users' needs. And the second is, service design thinking and service design thinking is to uh, identify some uh, design guidelines or some design principles directions of uh, how to design a service and some activities could be involved in this phase in this phase would be uh, the cons doing a consumer journey map or affinity diagram or touch points to uh, understand to um, filter to understand the use to to generate some design guidelines. And the generating means generating ideas. So people will do brainstorming or they will do participatory design to generate some ideas of the service. Right. And here I put participatory design means will involve users in the design process or involve all the stakeholders in the design process. And it's good that um, we have a brainstorming toolkit, right, in the class. So maybe whenever you 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 are doing your <laughs> survey design projects, we have some toolkit in hand so that everyone can use it for your projects. <laughs> but that's good, we have an, another instrument that everyone can use to, to brainstorm their ideas. Right. And the next phase of survey design is filtering. And filtering simple just filter some bad ideas to select good ideas. Right. So normally people will do cognitive walkthrough or car sorting or people do focus group expert evaluations regarding 
uh, which uh, service ID, survey design ideas is most re relevant to users' needs and re most relevant to uh, corporate or organizational objectives and values. And the last phase is realizing and explaining. So realizing and explaining means um, in survey design, and we generate, of course, we generate some prototypes. And explaining means since we have all stakeholders, so whenever we uh, generate some uh, design ideas, then we have to demonstrate the outcomes in front of those major stakeholders and to see if whether or not it's, if it's going to work or in the market or not and make some adjustments. So the last phase uh, is kind of bring everyone together. So uh, sometimes people will use uh, storyboarding, describing uh, ideas step by step, or people will also do persona, and people will do more board to explain the uh, idea of the service design. So, all right, so we can actually, we can map all the faces here. So then see the first understanding is identification of needs. Second, survey design thinking is very similar to analysis. And survey design generating is very similar to generating some uh, principles and prototypes. Filtering, just filter some bad ideas and to select most relevant ideas. And realizing and explaining is very similar to the, the phase between design and implementation. So I hope you won't feel disappointed in survey design. The design framework process does not have much difference to a traditional user centered design process. Right. So, do you have any idea, any questions so far? Uh, yeah, it's, it's just common that I think they have to somehow change the term because, you know, user-centered design somehow is much more focused on the client, but maybe service design you have to you know, consider all stakeholders, not only clients. Right. So maybe that's why they try to you know, put some terms a little bit more generalized because you cannot only just get the idea of users, right? Or as well, you also have to uh, get the idea from other stakeholders, which means the service provider or front end, the back end of the, the employees, right? So maybe that's why I think they have to change some terms, right? I don't know, this is my yeah, In terms process. of the process, they are very similar, but the, the activities have uh, going up at different phases, they are a little bit different. Like uh, the understanding part, we don't, we don't only understand users' needs. We also have to understand the service providers, their objectives and values. We also have to uh, understand environmental constraints. Like sometimes maybe uh, due to the governments, they have some regulations. So they regulate something in this way. So you have to consider about that in order to develop a good service. So, um, so again, the survey design scale is much more bigger. Right. So, but in terms of the process, very similar, but activities are different. Right. Right. So when, right, So how do we evaluate a service design? And here I just give you one example. Of course, there may be different ways to evaluate a survey design, and. This model is um, that I got a, a research paper from also from Korean researchers. Right, so they come up with this model, and this model really reflects what we just mentioned. So actually, in this model, we have some provider side, we have consumer side. Right. So from whenever we generate a design, then we have to think about the two different parts and see if two different parts can match together. So you can see in this model, from the consumer side, we conduct survey or sometimes interview and do some analysis and see if the design really reflects our design goal. And if it's not, 
then we go back to do redesign in this year. We come down to the next, move on to the next stage. But at the same time, we have to think about the provider side. Provider side, they have their own needs. So the major needs of them is to make money, right? Right. And also, they have, from the provider side, provider's perspective, they have to also consider about, again, like the environmental constraints and like government regulations or a lot of things can, or they have to consider about their competitors. So a lot of things, the service uh, provider, they have to think and they have their own needs. So there's a checkpoint that's here and see, we can evaluate our ideas from the provider's perspective. But if it's feasible, then we move on to the next day. If it's not, we go back and change the idea. So again, like the model that I just showed, the service provider, they have needs, customer has a need. So sometimes you have a common balance between the two. So the activity is kind of going on right here. So once the two side, they, their needs or expectations, they have a big overlap, then we do an evaluation. And then later on, you'll become a, a, a research outcome or design outcome. Right. And to give you one example of this paper, so actually they do a uh, the car sharing service. So they evaluate this service. So I, I don't want to go through the details, but you can see from their evaluation results, there are a service provider side and consumer side. So you can see from the consumer side, they have expected value. What expected value means, like from a perspective of car sharing, the consumers, they want to have a high level of convenience. And they, their needs, they want to have low fare. So it's cheap and convenient. That's from consumer side, that's their needs. And the second intention to adopt. So they actually, they uh, deliver, uh, administer uh, survey to customers and see whether or not the customers they want to use this service or not. So their result shows a neutral but possibly uh, positive. And also evaluate preferred use of service and here, the, part, the customer, from customer side, they want the parking, the, the car sharing service takes place near the parking lot. And it also will go one way through. Right, so um, when you are doing your evaluations, you can take these uh, measurements for your service design uh, projects. Right, so it really depends on the topic of projects and you can do a different uh, evaluations for the consumer's needs. And also for the provider's side, so they have to think about, uh, we have to do the multiple effect. So since um, uh, they are designing a car sharing service, so they have to think about the CO2 emission reduction. Then they also have to think about from the company's perspective, how much they have to in base, so. right, and also talk, they have to consider about regulations perspective, and they have to consider about technological feasibility, whether or not a company has a technology to implement the uh, service. So, from the provider side, from the consumer side, they have two different uh, expectations. So, whenever we try to evaluate survey design idea, then we have to think about it too. So this will be a different from the traditional uh, interface design evaluation. We always evaluate here, right? right? So this is just an example about how you evaluate certain design. And all right, so next I'll talk about touch points. All right, so if you want to take a break or you want to move on. Uh, how long do you expect to finish this one? Uh, maybe 20 minutes. Uh, then I think it's better to continue. Okay. Yeah. All right, so uh, we just mentioned about touch point, right? So touch point is a new idea that introduced by survey design. 
Right. So in some design, all touch points have to be considered and totally and prep. The prep means you have to consider very carefully in order to create a clear, consistent, unified consumer experience. And here, touch point, uh, I just mentioned previous is a contact point between consumer and the service provider. So a touch point also means everything the consumer use to verify the services effectiveness. Since a touch point is between the service provider and the customer, so the customers, the clients, they have no idea about how the corporations operate. The, the only way they learn about the service is through the touch points. So the, the third, okay. So here different people give different interpretations, right? So you can see different people, they have their own different perspective. I just put them all together, give you a general idea. Okay, so touch point also means a tangibles. And so they can be touched, they are physical artifacts, and that make up by uh, make up the total experiences. And according to the two organizations, touch point means the physical elements of a service, and touch point also means environmental, environmental aspects of the service. Right. So you can see the pictures at the bottom. So you have clients, you have organizations, and you have different touch points. So actually touch point, they serve as the interface between uh, organization and the client. So, let me give you some example of a touch point. So for example, as a bank service, this will be a physical building. <coughs> this will be a first touch point. Internet can be also a touch point. The physical bank statement or um, paper, they can also be a touch point. Or even a check can be a touch point. An ATM machine, it's a touch point. Credit card, touch point. Also, you, you have some uh, customer representative people that like they are in a bank helping you to go through to satisfy your needs. They are all touch points. And call center. And the, the agent on the other side of the hotel. And also now we have the technology. So we have some mobile applications. So you can see there are so many touch points involved in the service. So we have to consider the design of all touch points. So from here you can see what? The touch point for the Bank of America. Assuming that the design is good, but a lot of people complain about their service. But, right. but you can see they have the internal of the color, right? And their design elements, and also their uniform, and their logo, right? ATM design, check, and website. So it's consistent. This is from just from the design's perspective, but the contents is more important, right? So the interfaces of ATM has to be designed. The layout, actually, the um, the customers, the, the representative at the bank, whether or not if they have a smiling face or not, or if they are well trained or not, they can be a, a touch point or the bad touch point. And also, the interactions between you and the telephone services, telephone agents. So they are all touch points. But uh, 
don't be afraid that there's so many touch points you have to design <laughs> in the service design projects. <coughs> Since a lot of times we don't really create a brand new service. So we are trying to uh, use like observation, interview, or we try to use contextual inquiry to identify some problematic areas and we redo the design. Right. So it's not we are doing a brand new uh, survey design, but maybe Professor Lee may, may get a Jiho may get a big project design a, a brand new service then that would be a, a, a big project. Right. But normally we're designing some uh, improving some uh, poor uh, service. Yeah, I mean, within these several days, right, it's almost impossible to create a new so instead of that, maybe it's a better idea that you can improve, right, from the existing problem, then we just try to give them some better idea. I think it's better because it's just six days or something, right? I don't believe that we can really create a new. But if you have a good idea, you can just put some suggestion. Most likely, I think you can improve instead of really creating yeah. a new. Or maybe it can be a PhD dissertation. Oh, uh, maybe we we'll take the service design as a dissertation, so maybe he can take some seriously, but yeah, <laughs> other people can just enjoy, right? So, uh, <laughs> I don't, I mean, I hope that I don't really put too much burden to him, but anyway, it's true. I mean, right, he right. really wants to take the uh, service design as his serious his tricky thesis, so maybe you have to really seriously, especially his point is about touch point. So now is really the time that you really have keen and interesting. So. Right. Since uh, the PhD work, the scale is larger than the uh, master's work. So you can think about creating a brand new service. Right. And so at the same time, you will also bring in a new business. So it's not a bad thing. Maybe you can, like, after graduation, you can open a company like uh, offering a special service in some area and which nobody has. Yeah. Oh, if you get a big money, let's hear it. <laughs> so those are just examples of touch points. All right, so this will be a touch point uh, wheel for brand, right? But uh, these, those touch points there are uh, generated from the perspective of uh, the business uh, in the area of business, not from the, the area of design. So you can see some touch points, they are not really tangible because it's a brand touch point, it's not a service touch point. So you can see, but the common uh, survey design timeline between different fields is they also have a pre purchase and they have an actual purchase and the post uh, purchase experience. Right. So in terms of the service timeline, they are all the same. But since this is referring to the brand, so you can see like uh, a pre-purchase experience will include website, advertisement, then collateral. And for the purchase experience, it involves products and the point of purchasing displays product performance and parts delivery and for post purchase experience about product quality loyalty program and also building and also customer service right. these are not examples just showing you the, the touch point so that when you are reading papers and maybe in the business field don't be surprised that they have some intangible uh, touch points, and this will be this will be another example of touch point. But actually, this will, this is considered a consumer journey map, which I will just mention it here. So, mm -hmm. the touch points they are physical objects, artifacts on the map. So imagine this this will be a photography. Uh, ecosystem. So they are in whenever you try to uh, involve with taking pictures, then you will have the activities of capture and manage the the pictures that you 
you take, right, using a digital camera, then you will share with your friends, you publish and share. So those are activities. And on the right hand column here, they are all touch points. Right. So I will show you that in your survey design projects that each of the group can generate this kind of uh, consumer journey map. So the map will map out the touch point and activities. And you can see this will be, uh, this is a persona representing uh, most users. Then his first journey is from here, here, and here, and here, and here. Yeah, but I don't want to go to the details, but I just want to show you the touch points. So a touch point can be a digital camera, and mobile phone, and PC application, and website application, portable media player, and print media, and also home media center. So those are the different touch points, and they reflect at different activities in a consumer journey when they interact with consumers' clients interact with a service. Okay, so well, I can't is be scared. it true? <laughs> is it true? Mechanical engineers. <laughs> right. So there's so many touch points I just use this uh, picture to illustrate the idea of touch points. So we have to consider all. All right, so next idea is consumer journey map, so which we just see. And so the consumer journey map and touch point, they are two new ideas that introduced by certain design, which is not covered in user experience research. Consumer journey map, of course, I, before we show you the, the examples, we have to look at the definition first. So the consumer journey map is here, the process of describing or tracking all the experiences of the customers when they encounter a service or when they encounter several services. And so here, um, so you can see there will be different consumer journeys, right? So when they interact with a service. So we have, again, we have different touch points, but sometimes the users or clients, they may start from a particular uh, touch point. They don't necessarily start from the touch point at the very beginning. So different person, different clients, the the way they break into the system will be different. Right. So it means that there will be different consumer journey map. Right. So every individual person may have one journey and also in Every journey will involve different touch points, right? So, so by using the consumer journey map, and it really helps the organization to rethink about their values and their objective and also the assumptions, right? So sometimes if they expect users, this will be a, a very good service for users, right? And when uh, survey designer, they uh, conduct contextual inquiry observations, they find out the consumer journey map is like this, which is different from the corporate or, or company's uh, uh, expectations. So the consumer journey map can reflect and, and to reflect on the changes of the, the company's objectives. Right. And also, so by engaging the customers, you can move from some incremental service improvements to uh, a, ideally a genuine service transformation. Since the consumer journey map it just shows touch points and the consumer journeys, everything at one place, right? So it does not show you pieces of information. So it gives you one a big picture so that you can identify some problematic areas in the journey so that you will know where you have to redesign in order to uh, make the whole journey more pleasant, more enjoyable to the current clients. So also the consumer journey map also does not only consider 
or included information about what happened to a uh, particular clients. Sometimes the consumer journey also will include clients' responses. So that when we show the map, we we'll see the problem areas, but we we'll also see some short summary about what's, what happened for that particular point. So again, so this will be an example of a consumer journey map. A consumer journey map can be also hand written or hand drawn. So you can see the different touch points, and if they may not have the accuracy at the top, but you can see some interactions and right, match different um, touch points with the journey. Maybe the falling down is like maybe some. Yeah. Okay. This would be this one. Oh. Right. So there is no formal way of generating the consumer journey map. Right. And this is another way of presenting it. Like this in this example we're buying an iron in a grocery store. Right. So you can see they have activities in the middle and then from the top it's good consumer experience and the bottom is bad consumer experience. So this kind of separate out the goods and bad. So you know those areas are the things that you need to redesign. Right. So this is another way of presenting it. Right. And as a designer you can come up with your own way of presenting uh, consumer journey map. So it means that it can be a a new research project, like how to show information more effectively so that people can uh, capture users' needs and or corporations' needs more easily or more efficient. That can be a, another research project. Right. Since now there's a no formal way, so different people they have their own different. Yeah, especially yeah. if you want to put more information, right? That will right. be very challenging, right? You can put more dimension, but uh, visualize it can be very effective to show Right, so it can be a, a, maybe a research project comparing the design outcomes of different formats of the journey map. Right. So, why the consumer journey map is, is useful? So first, of course, we want to understand the user's needs, particularly from the client's perspective and from the corporation's perspective. And we have, the, the journey map is used to design and also investigate, uh, examine the systems, the whole service process. And also the map, journey map is also used to facilitate the interactions or collaborations between uh, departments in a corporation. And also it allows the company to know how they allocate their resources because some of the journey map can show problematic areas but some of the areas they are not that major or they are not that big to resolve and some of the, the points that the problems they are small right and or sometimes the companies they have to allocate a lot of money to, in order to resolve one area so in real situations, the map can help the company to decide which area they want to uh, resolve and which area and how much resources they want to allocate to different um, problematic areas. And this will be another type of uh, a consumer journey map, right? So actually, some people use a term interchangeably with client journey map. Some people say consumer journey map. So there's no common. Just these, those are terms that you came across. All right. So this will be the whole process, right? So imagine a person sitting at home, 
they pass some information, he do something, and there's a virtual assistant leading him on a website, and he call an agent after interacting with the, the virtual assistant. So all activities we can consider that as a free service period. So a person interact with the service at home. Then the next, the person is trying to get to the service, right? So he will just look for cost store and try to get a coupon using their mobile device. And also at the store, when a person get to the store, there are also some service points and uh, the things going on there. So when the customers get to the, the, the stores, they are recognized they are on uh, gold member. So um, they inform uh, real time information is going on the screens, and they can use their uh, mobile phone to pay for the products. So there are also some uh, services happen at the store. And there are some services uh, after the sales, which you can do for a person he received a uh, message, and he can get additional information about products they buy, and they can get some feedback from the other people from the companies. So this will be another type of consumer journey map. Okay. So I thought this is an example from uh, the guide that you just saw about consumer journey map. I, I can go through it quickly. So this is a photography ecosystem map. So here they have different activity, right? So you can see camera and here, phone and digital camera, they use for capture. And desktop is used for manage the pictures they capture. And at the top here, they try to share the pictures they uh, take at the beginning. And they may want to publish it to like Flickr or to some websites. So there are four major activities happening of the whole thing. And here the the difference between the top and bottom is that the top is associated with public distribution and the bottom is private distribution. So they may want to put their pictures on a digital frame or print or print out. And there's another way of looking at the activities. Those activities they are at the door for someone to share information with the people using the computer through the website, and also you want to use a mobile phone to show like a picture you take with your friends. So it happens outdoor, indoor, and outdoor, and indoor, right. So actually there are some activities happening uh, regarding a particular service. So we can look at a service from different perspectives so that we can get a big picture about how to redesign it. Okay, those are just means the A and B means different uh, consumer journey. So this says there are some different configurations using different interfaces within different contexts, indoor, outdoor, and depending on indoor and outdoor they can involve different interactions. And also, it can involve different result outcomes regarding how you share your information, like uh, physically in the environment or digitally on the internet. So there are different kinds of journeys can happen. So this this guy just give an example. So the way he presented is connecting the dots. So we have touch points here that we can. This will be a one type of uh, consumer journey. So this person use camera, mobile phone, capture, picture, and they use their PC magic, and they decide to use a web to publish and share. Right. So this can be a journey. And another journey can be in this way. This person uses his mobile phone, capture the picture 
and the scene and publish it using a website and then also they print it out. Right. So you can imagine that uh, for your service design projects you can generate a lot of this kind of uh, journey map. Another example, this will be the last one. The, the morning lecture will be done. <laughs> okay. This will be a restaurant. Right. This will be uh, the consumer journey for a typical restaurant. And here I just want to show you how you can use a uh, consumer journey map to generate a brand new <coughs> ideas by switching the orders of different activities. So the example at the top here, okay, so whenever we go to a restaurant, we enter, find a table, and we sit. We order food, and there are some entries will come, come to you, and you enjoy your food, you pay, you exit. Right, this traditional restaurant, right? So what if we switch order? Make a Facebook restaurant. So they switch it, so when we go to the restaurant, we enter, but we immediately order food. So you can see order right here. So you switch it here. So order food and you pay. After you pay, you find a table. Enjoy food, you get it. So if you switch the activities, you can generate a brand new service, like a best food. Transiting from restaurant, traditional restaurant, to a Facebook, Facebook restaurants, so that you can have, you can house more customers at one time. Just like McDonald's. Okay. So they're just switching the orders of different activities. Okay. So service journey map, again, they, they can involve many touch points, or um, consumer may can enter the, the service at different touch points, and there is no best way. And so, when we do the service design, we design for the connections between touch points. Right, so, those are the references. Okay, so, any questions? <coughs>